tycoons of small biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host, Austin Peterson, here as always. And this is typically when I would introduce my co-host, the best in the business, Landon Mance, but he has decided that it was more important to travel with his family from Southern California back to Vegas today during the uh, radio program. So he'll have to catch this one a little bit later. If this is the first time that you're listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, this is a radio program and a podcast by small business owners for small business owners. Landon and I are both uh, children of entrepreneurs and our business owners ourselves. We believe that the small business owner in this country is truly the backbone of the American economy. And we uh, put this show together a little over a year ago to highlight small businesses and what they're doing for their local economy, to tell their stories, tell about their families and give them an opportunity to have a platform to, to really shine and, uh, and share some good wisdom and nuggets with the rest of us uh, small business owners out there. And so to that end, today we're excited to have Richard Bird with TYG or the Yellowstone Group commercial real estate brokerage firm out of uh, Lehigh, Utah. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks, Austin. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, you bet. So uh, we were talking a little bit before the show started and uh, Richard and I have actually known each other for a little over 15 years. So this is a, a unique opportunity with for me with the show to have somebody on that I that I know so well. We did lose contact there for a while. We both moved out of state. We lived in the same neighborhood for a while. Uh, we reconnected maybe three or four months ago and uh, and became you know, reacquainted and, and updated each other. So I'm excited to, to have you on the show and tell a little bit about, uh, you know, what it is that you've been doing over the last 15 or so years. But we typically start by having our entrepreneurs tell a little bit about themselves personally. So if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Tell us about your family. Uh, I know some of the background, of course, but our listeners don't. So the floor yeah. is yours. Thanks. I uh, appreciate it. And it was, it was great to reconnect with you. I mean, it says something about it when you when you don't see somebody or talk to somebody for a while and you reconnect and you just you just keep it right off from where it was before and that was that was awesome and it's great to be here with you and and your uh audience today so yeah i grew up in idaho falls idaho we kind of bounced back and forth between a, a couple different states we lived in idaho and washington state we lived in utah and but i ultimately graduated from a high school in idaho falls idaho and then went to college in uh, provo utah byu and did a church mission in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and uh, came back, graduated. And then right as soon as I graduated from college, I got into commercial real estate through a friend of mine uh, recommended that I speak to a guy named Adam Christofferson, who uh, was a, a very instrumental really in my entire career, throughout my entire career. And he remains to this day a very good friend. So he got me in the business. And then I worked for that company uh, with him for almost 15 years. And uh, my, my wife and I, we had triplets in 2012, and it got to the point where I was at a stage in my career where either, you know, something had to give. It was either going to be my family or it was going to be work, and you know, I'd come home at night, and my wife was taking care of triplets and just felt a little bit guilty, uh, a lot guilty, actually, and, you know, just the work that she had to do every single day, and so uh, I, was, I was speaking with my brother who was a salesperson with a pharmaceutical company. Um, I mean, we'd always kind of launched, uh, talked about the idea of launching a firm together. And so finally uh, he was in a position where he could step aside. I was in a position where I could break away and we launched our firm TYG Commercial Real Estate. And really the, the result of that was just the opportunity or the, the, the impetus for that was the opportunity to work with family and to be able to spend more time to be there with my wife and kids and, and it's been a great journey. We're now four years into it. Uh, we initially started our office in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I left my last firm. I was in Denver, Colorado, and then went back to Idaho Falls, Idaho, where, where I grew up. But 
uh, I've worked in offices in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. We ran offices in Salt Lake City, Boise, Idaho, and then worked as the national director for a publicly traded commercial real estate firm uh, as their, basically, you could technically call it kind of like their CEO of their self-storage division. And they oversaw the sale of self-storage facilities nationwide. And so they did, when I was with them, they were doing about $2 billion a year in transactions. And, and that was great. It was a great opportunity for me to work on a national level and on a very uh, high level leader, senior leadership position that really gave me a lot of great background um, and experience to launch my own firm. And so, you know, I'd be remiss to not mention uh, them and those people that um, sponsored me to get to where I am today. Very thankful for them. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> it's a pretty common story to hear, you know, from entrepreneurs that kind of worked for another organization and then decided to go on their own. And obviously, when you pair that with a brother uh, that wants to get into business with you and, you know, have an opportunity to work as family, that that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. Obviously, yeah. it sounds like you guys have had a good relationship over the years and, and you felt like it would be a good thing. But, right. you know, let's fast forward for the years. What, what's it been like? How, how has your relationship changed between you and your brother uh, now that you're business partners in addition to being brothers? Yeah, the crazy thing about, you know, he's older than I am. He's five years older than I am and had a completely different background. And I think the, the reason I felt we'd be a great fit is he came with a skill set from the pharmaceutical sales industry. He was very talented at sales. And I saw, you know, having overseen 300 investment brokers in my career, you kind of got a sense for who, who has a knack for this. And I, I just knew all along that he'd be a great partner. And we really complement each other. I'm the youngest. Um, and, and with that comes, you know, certain personality traits. And as an older brother, uh, he's able to kind of rein some of that in. And it's been, it's been great. Like, I think if we were both exactly the same i could see some conflict there but i think we really complement each other especially where we come from two different backgrounds and and as you grow up you kind of you're no longer you're no longer really just you're not hanging out every single day and so when we came back together it was awesome and it was really dynamic and just to see him uh, uh you know take on this business and learn this new language and he's 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 you know way better than i am at this now, I mean, four years into it. And so, yeah, I really think that we complement each other on a lot of things. And, um, it, you know, but don't get me wrong, like it, you have, I'm sure a lot of people on your show that have partnered with family and you're right, that there are challenges that doesn't come with, it's not always rosy. I think you could probably argue with a brother a lot easier than you could if it wasn't a family member. And, you know, so you do, I, I, I we, we, we have to keep that in mind. And the nice thing, for us, though, is he is running our office in Idaho or, and lives in Idaho Falls, and I live in, in, in Utah now. And so we don't see each other every day. And, and I think having a little bit of separation helps um, where he can run his thing and I can run my thing. But then we're always going back and forth, whether it's text message or a phone call. And it's to the point now where the company really is, is self-sufficient so that there's not, a, there's not really a lot of, a lot of conflict or any reason to have conflict at this point we're old enough that that's no longer an issue i think early on yeah. when when you're just starting it up and the finances are like holy cow what did we do like we both just left careers uh you know long careers where you're like man um you're getting down to your last pennies eat both of you and that stress that comes with that is you just can't describe it to anybody unless you've felt that stress of what it's like to put in your life savings and step aside from a career to launch a business. Um, you know, that's very stressful, but then to couple that with a family member and knowing that his wife and kids who are, you know, my family as well. So you're carrying that burden. And I know he was carrying that burden about my wife and kids. Um, it just adds and multiplies this stress effect. And, and I could see why that would be hard on most relationships. And, you know, fortunately I have a really good brother. He's been fantastic and I couldn't ask for a better partner. Yeah. No, I think it's, so a couple of things that stick out to me in that. So I, a few weeks ago, we had a husband and wife team on um, who also then run the business with another husband and wife team. But if I remember wow. right, they married sisters, like the two guys married sisters. And so, wow. you know, like 
all four of them are working in the business day in and day out. And we talked a little bit about the struggles and, and you know, setting certain boundaries. And when you're at work, you're, you're business partners. When you're at home, you're husband and wife. And, you know, that's not an easy thing to do to kind of check that at the door, either door, whether it's going into the office or, or going home um, and just, you know, completely step out of it. But you know, they were figuring it out. Luckily for you, that's, it's not that intertwined. And like you said, it's, you know, also out of state. But the other thing that, that stuck out was actually a conversation that I remember having with you probably the first or second time that we ever met. And you were the first commercial real estate person that I knew. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just having a conversation about, you know, getting into the business and, you know, how you got into that. And, um, there were a couple of people that worked for me at the time that thought that that would be a cool, you know, career to go after. And I remember very vividly you saying, well, it can be a great career, but if they want to go into this, they need to go in with two to three years of expenses covered, meaning that they can live without making a dime for two to three years, yeah. which is also very similar to what I do for a living as well. Right. But yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about that. I mean, today you've got, tell us how many agents you have working for yeah. you today and, and how that is for them to kind of jump in and start at zero. Yeah, that's great. You remember that because it's, it's so true. I, and I had to do it twice, right? So when I came out of college, you go and you, and you go to college with the expectations that you're going to come out and you're going to have this sweet job and you're going to have this massive income that you're not used to having and having insurance and and I remember the person that encouraged me to do this. He told me exactly what I told you. He said, you're going to go two or three years and, and basically just not make a penny. And, but if you're the hardest working person in that office in two to three years, you'll make more money than anybody, you know, and, but, you know, with that, the hardest working person in office, what did, wasn't easy. Um, it's the same reason that athletes are successful. Usually it's the hardest working one. And it's very similar in our business. And so I did it right out of college at once. And I think my, I didn't close my first deal until I'd been in the business almost 18 months. And so you, I mean, my credit, I'd racked up all kinds of credit cards. Fortunately, I was single at the time and, and just had just a massive amounts of debt. And, you know, it really does take two or three years by the time you pay that off and kind of get your feet under you. And so to, you know, to, to leave that career, I had joined the management team of, of, of another firm and, and left the production side of things and worked in senior leadership, senior management. And so had a very nice, we went public, had a nice, very nice income. And, and to step away from really tenure and, um, and seniority in a firm where I knew the rest of my life, I was going to be financially set had I stayed with them. And it really on paper didn't make a lot of sense to say, I'm going to give up all of this career, everything I've built, all of this seniority with a firm that I love and a company that I love and, and start all over again. It was absolutely crazy. And I'm sure they, they, I know they thought the same thing. In fact, when I told them I was leaving, they, they couldn't believe it. It was just shock. And so uh, it was, it was a little bit crazy and dumb and it, on paper, but you know, you got, you got to look at that family component. When I came home at night, the, the relationships that mattered and not that my work relationships didn't matter before, but that really the, the most important relationship and it is my wife and my kids. And that was the most important that I, that I make that work. And so we had a lot of discussion, my wife and I, about this is going to take some time to step back and go and not make any money. And, and we were the difference this time around. Not only did we have to drum up new business, we had to create an entirely new company. And so it was six to eight months just to get the infrastructure in place before we could even really start selling and getting out there and representing, you know, properties and, and helping our clients. And so it was, you know, it, which you'd think, man, this guy's been in the business 15 years. He's overseen 300 agents and managed and hired and trained. You think that he'd come out and in six months could get to a deal. And, you know, even somebody with that kind of experience and tenure and clients, we were still another 18 months before we really got some traction because we had to set up the company and, and get rolling again. And so, yeah, that is the hardest part. I, like your business, the hardest part for most people is understanding that, yeah, you are 
sacrificing everything. I mean, I had a partner who, when he got into the business, he, he put a, a second mortgage on his house and, and lived on it. And, you know, he took on the debt to go do this and he's still in the business and he's just, he's very successful uh, here in Utah. And, and he's no longer doing commercial real estate, but he's still in the industry and he's one of the you know most well-known guys around. It's just awesome. And I, I look at somebody like that, that was willing to take that kind of jump, that kind of sacrifice of believing in himself enough to go take out a second mortgage on his house. And I don't recommend that for everyone. Like some people, it's not, it's, it's, it goes back to that advice of, that I was given. If you're the hardest working person and you know, you're going to be the hardest working person, then a, then a risk like that isn't as risky. But if typically you're not the hardest working person or you don't, you, you don't have that confidence that you've had that in the past, then yeah, this is, you're right. This could, this is, this can be really scary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely, you know, all in, I mean, you're, you're betting a hundred percent on yourself. You don't make it. You don't have the money to pay that mortgage back. You lose that house, your credits, you know, ruined for a while. You, and you've got to try to kind of rebuild that. So tell us a little bit more about the conversation that you had with Mahalia when she, when you, you know, let her know, cause she wasn't there the first time you said you were, you know, you were single when you went through this the first time. So right. she didn't experience it. And I'll just, I'll tee it off for you by saying, I sold a practice of mine in Southern California before you and I met. Right. I got, I came back and I got my MBA and we're going to talk about that in a second. Cause you're working on yours right now. But, um, I moved to Utah to get my MBA and then when I finished, I just planned on starting another practice. And my wife said, nope, I remember what the first three years were like. And I'm not sure I want to do that again. And so I ended up taking a, a corporate job for an insurance brokerage at the time. Had, a, had, you know, had the salary, had the, all the stuff that you just mentioned. Could have had a great career trajectory. And then... Lo and behold, I was actually forced to make the decision later on because they were acquired by a large bank and they laid everybody off at my level on the same day. Mm. Well, that was enough to prompt me to say, okay, now, now I've got an opportunity to go and do this and some financial wherewithal to make my wife feel a little bit more comfortable than we did before. Plus the kids were a little older, all that sort of thing. So Tell us what that conversation was like with uh, Mahalia, because it doesn't sound like she at least shut it down the way that my wife Robin did. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's not an easy conversation when when you come home and and you're having those feelings that hey, this is this is a route I want to take. Uh, fortunately, uh, she also believed in you know that I had a partner in my brother who. Um, it wasn't just going at it alone like I did the first time, and she knew that, you know, he was a go-getter, is a go-getter and highly successful and also had the financial wherewithal to last himself. Cause right. Had you got, if you get into a partnership with somebody and, and you make those types of sacrifices and they're not in a position finance, same position financially as you, that, that could create some conflict. And so we knew that he, he had the ability to last. Um, and, and in fact, he was in a better position than we were. And so there was that, but also our kids were four years old. And I think we, we had to look at it as, okay, if we're going to do this, we need to do this now because as they get older, it's going to be harder because they're going to be in school. Uh, they're going to have friends that they're not going to want to leave. And so there was a very small window where this worked for our family. We don't have any other kids outside of the triplets. And, and so she was, of course, uh, and, you know, and then on top of that, moving from Denver, Colorado, which is one of the most amazing cities in the United States, where we'd lived twice. It's where we lived when we first got married before we, we moved to Highland. And um, we love Denver. And I would say it was probably the, the idea of leaving Denver to go to Idaho Falls, where my family was, was probably more intimidating to her than anything, right? So she had had me all to herself. And, and we were able to build a relationship without having family around um, taking away from that, that chance we had to build our relationship together. And so I'm, I think more than anything, the concern was, wait, we're going to live a mile from your mom. We're going to live two blocks from your brother. Um, all of your friends, you're going to leave me and hang out with everybody. And you're just going to leave us in Idaho 
while you go have this wonderful experience with all of your friends and family and just leave, leave me with the triplets like you do at work. I, th I think that was the bigger conversation, not so much the financial aspect, because we had always tried to live, uh, you know, light. We, we don't try to live outside of our means and try to have a nice nest egg. And so we knew that we could last. Um, we had, we had set aside and we had saved for the, you know, for the day. Cause you never know, like what if we, we lived through the downturn in 2008, um, you were there. Um, and that real, what happened in, the, in that real estate market. And you saw like, even in our neighborhood, it was, there were some homes that, that were short, short sold two or three times. And so having lived through that real estate cycle, we just, we just hoarded our money. And so we knew we'd be okay financially, but I think when we got to Idaho and, and she realized that the, the, you know, when I said that we're leaving because I needed to spend more time with her and my kids and she saw that that really happened. Um, I think, I think she probably the first few months, she, she was probably a little skeptical. And then when she saw that, Hey, this is, this is for real. It's all about us. Um, I think that that really comforted her. And, and then we were, we were off to the races at that point. So yeah, I, I know on her part, there was for sure, definitely a little bit of nervousness. Um, and you're right. She didn't go through it the first time, like, like your wife did with you, but she did date me. And when she first met me, um, I, I was living with some roommates where we I was graduated from college. I was broke as could be trying to break into this business. And I was literally sleeping on an air mattress cot. And the first day, like her, it was, it was on Valentine's day, which happened to be the day that our kids were born, you know, however long later, but on Valentine's day, I was so broke. Uh, we, I literally could only afford to go to, it was like, a, it was like an olive garden, similar concept to an olive garden. And I could only afford one, one meal that we had to share on takeout. And I got her a plastic rose from like the dollar store. So she did date me through that period. And she was still willing to marry me. And, you know, so, you know, she's an Iowa farm girl and she didn't grow up, you know, with, with a lot uh, in regards. I mean, she had a lot in regards to a great family and great siblings. And, but it's not like they were living just like, you know, high on the hog um, and had high expectations that I was just going to provide this unbelievable lifestyle for her. And um, she, she was very grounded just like I was. And, and so, yeah, I'm very fortunate to have a great wife and very supporting. She's, you know, she's always been very, very supportive of, of all the decisions I've made and, and we're a great team. I, there's no way I could do it without her. So, so did, I, did I lose you or did you get choked up there for a minute? Because I got <laughs> no, there was no way and then I lost you. Yeah, you must have lost me a little bit. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, there's no way that I could have done it without, without a very supportive wife. And yeah, let's chalk that up till I got choked up. Hopefully, she's listening right now. And yeah, I, I was choking. <laughs> <up there. laughs> yeah, right. All right. So, I mean, incredible story. She's an incredible woman. I remember you guys going through the IVF and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, and and. Uh, we weren't super close, but you know, we were close enough that I knew what was going on and you guys shared some, some stories there. So let's fast forward now. I mean, you quit the, the commercial job or the, the corporate job to have more time to spend with your family, but now you've built this, you know, started a brand new business, you're raising triplets and you're getting an MBA and you just got done telling me, you did all of that while spending more time with your family than you did before. So for all of those listeners out there, what's the secret? <laughs> you know, you have to simplify and um, you have to be willing to say no to things. And I think when you're, when, when you're somebody that's highly competitive and motivated, you want to take every opportunity that comes your way because you never know where that might lead. And my experience has told me that as I've done that and took more and more and more on, it only led to happiness, unhappiness. And I had a lot of really cool things and cool titles and material things, but I wasn't happy. And yeah, the money was awesome. And, but that was bizarre to me. I climbed this corporate ladder. I got higher than I ever thought I would at a pretty young age. And I was standing on the top of the mountain and asking myself, 
what next? And is this worth it? And I really had to reevaluate my priorities and my, really my assumptions and my preconceptions about what life is all about and, and what I wanted to become. And I'm fortunate to have uncovered that at, in my 30s and, and, and not later in my life. And, and I really consider myself very lucky and blessed that that, that happened early and so that we could make those changes and those moves to, to be able to, to, like you're saying, to do that, to be able to coach my kid's soccer team. And I would have never been able to do that before or be able to go get my MBA, like you're saying, and race triplets, which was unbelievably difficult. I'm, I'm sure you remember the neighborhood was amazing. Our neighborhood was also very, very supportive and very helpful as we went through that. But, you know, we were changing. It was it, typically it was about 12 diapers a day per baby. You know, we're, we're changing 36 diapers a day. And I was commuting back and forth to Las Vegas and running an office in Salt Lake. And I would stay in Vegas two or three days a week. And it was just, I was, I was running on empty all the time. And so was my wife. And so we were forced to learn how to say no to things just because there was no more to give. There was no more gas to, to give to anything else. And so, you know, fortunately, I guess you could say, I mean, people might look at, wow, triplets, that would be impossible while you're doing everything you're doing. What that did is it forced us to learn how to prioritize what's important. And so I've gotten very good at saying no to a lot of things and simplifying a lot of things. My dad is, he simplifies everything. Life is actually pretty simple. And I think we make it pretty complicated, more complicated than it needs to be. And if you keep those priorities in mind, which is your family and your kids and providing for them, um, and you focus on the relationships that matter versus the relationships that don't matter. And it's, and when I say that, it doesn't, I'm not saying that you can't have friends and, you know, I definitely had a lot of friends, but they, they are given a different type of priority and effort than, than my family gets. And so how I've been able to do that, um, you know, you got to be really good with your time management and, and you have to have people that are supportive and that are going to be there for you. I'm fortunate as I go through my MBA that in my first year, I had an unbelievable team and that we were, they were all very successful business people as well. And we supported each other and understood that, Hey, um, there's going to be weeks where I can't help out. And there's going to be weeks where, you know, I'm going to have to step up and help when somebody's down. And so I've been blessed with a, with a great partner and my brother who's been able to step up and be supportive of me. And, and, and surrounding myself with people that are supportive of those types of decisions and having those conversations with them before you make those kind of big decisions um, that, that are going to affect them. Because those, those decisions, you know, of going off to get my MBA, that affected my partner. It affected my team. It affected my wife. And so those were long conversations that we had to have about, you know, are we, are we all going to be into this to get together? And, and fortunately, they were. Um, and then you know, in regards to the, to the triplets, um, you know, once again, having supportive friends, you know, I have, uh, some really, really good, um, supportive, you know, just friends and family and parents and siblings, but also, um, other people that outside of family, like my, you know, very good friend, Donna, Janet Miller, um, my wife's, um, uh, mom passed away not long before the triplets were born. And I know that was hard for my wife to not have a mom there. And we had kind of a surrogate grandparents that stepped in that to this day, my kids call them Nana and granddad, and they've been very supportive of us. And so I think being open and vulnerable and being willing to say, I need help and that I'm trying to do something that's important to me and asking for help, people have stepped up and they've been there for us. And, and, and I think it's important to recognize them and thank them for everything that they've done. To, to allow me to be able to do all this, all this stuff that, that to really are to accomplish my dreams. Um, but in regards to, yes, the question, how big is our company now? So because of that, um, that supports there, I have a, an excellent partner. And then there's eight of us in the company now, we are growing. Um, we have two offices, one in Idaho, one in uh, Utah. We also have an agent that's based in Montana, but he technically works out of our Idaho office. Um, and then we do business also in Colorado and Wyoming as well. Um, and we hired a loan originator actually out of Phoenix, um, Steve Lowell, um, his son, Wyatt Lowell was a, 
uh, all state basketball player down there. It's been fun to get to know him. Uh, and he, he now plays up here at one of the universities here in Utah. And um, I have agents that have worked for me that are there in Phoenix as well. And, and we have clients that own in that Phoenix market as well. So like good to go gas stations, they're a very good client of ours. And we appreciate, you know, working with them and, and are familiar with, with that market and working all the Southwest. The thing about commercial real estate is a lot, especially when you're an investment, you tend to work a lot of states and, you know, right now we're not licensed in Arizona, but we do have a lot of clients that do deals there. And so we'll co-op a deal or we'll send a deal to an agent in that market uh, to help us out. And in fact, there's a guy that just moved there. You talk about great sponsors in your life. Um, you know, his name's Bob Osbrink. Uh, one of my good friends just barely moved there to Phoenix. And I know that he has um, his son that's there as well. And uh, he's, he's just been also one of those people that's, that's been very supportive of us. And when those people speak highly of you and they get your name out there and they're there to support you, I mean, it means the, it means the world. And, and I think it's important too, that you recognize those people, but also you give back. Like you're not the one that's always sucking out of everyone else that you recognize, Hey, all of these people have helped us get where we are, that I've tried to do everything in my power to, I hope there are some people that if they were to come on a, on a show someday and they say, Hey, Richard Bird was a sponsor of me and he helped me out. And, and that's been an important priority of mine is especially the team and the agents that we have, um, that work for us. It's a big part of, of our firm is making sure that if we take care of our agents, they're going to take care of our clients. And if our clients are happy, they're going to continually come back to us. And so we've really, you know, hopefully the theme, I guess all of this, as I speak through it, the theme of really our approach and my personal approach is that relationships matter. Um, and you have to, you know, sponsor other people and be there to help other people um, because that's, that's how you, you're successful in life. And, and that's how we've been able to do it. That's how, and I say we, because it really is a we effort. It's not, it's not an I or a me. Uh, it's, it's a we, a very collective effort of, of a lot of people that have been able to help me do all these things. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's an important concept for all entrepreneurs to keep in mind. You know, I, I think that if you listen to the media, entrepreneurs or business owners sometimes get a bad rap and it's, you know, that, they're just money hungry and they're, you know, making millions of dollars off of the backs of the working man or woman, you know, so, but there are times when we need to realize that we do need to be more humble. We do need to recognize that the rest of the team is what's allowing us to achieve those types of things in our lives. We don't do it ourselves. None of us do. You know, I think one of the greatest examples that any of us have in, in this country that are at least, you know, your and I's age and, and older is Ronald Reagan, as a leader, understood the importance of surrounding himself with really, really smart people, way smarter than him in certain areas, and being humble enough to accept their feedback and their help. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I agree. And I think also that every person has something to give and recognizing whether or not it's the custodian or, you know, or, or the office manager that, you know, a lot of times I see people that just disrespect other people or, or your, your waitress or your waiter. Um, you know, every single person um, has something to give. And I, and I, and I agree with you. And if you, if you let them give that and, and, and share that what they have to give, they're going to shine a lot more. They're going to be happier and, and focusing on people's strengths and talents. So, but yeah, I, I love what you said about Ronald Reagan. I, I totally agree with you that you, you surround yourself with great people, but then on top of that, I think you got to recognize that every single person in the room has something to give and that's benefited me along the way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I don't remember who said it to me within the last few months, but somebody essentially shared with me the message that, one of their parents had shared with them. And that was that nobody's better than you. And th these are different words, but nobody's better than you and you're better than nobody else, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reality is we're all humans. We're all here trying to do the best that we can. And you have skills and talents that I don't have. And I have skills and talents that you don't have. And yep. that's the way that the whole world is. Yeah. Right? And we, just, we need to recognize the, the skills and talents and values in everybody around us. Mm -hmm. and make everybody better each day. Yeah, I love that. You know, when you're saying that, I think about my time in Haiti and 
Haiti is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. And, and I lived there for two years. I walked those streets. I spent time in their homes and got to know them on a personal level. The poorest people on this side of the world had so much to give and so much to teach. And, and really, I think a lot of the reason I am the way that I am and value relationships is because I learned it when I was down there. When you walked into a neighborhood or you walked into a community and let's say there's a whole bunch of houses that are overlooking, you know, maybe a small open area and there might be, I don't know, 20 or 30 people that live, you know, in houses that look out into this. If you walked into that neighborhood and you didn't say hi to everyone, that was offensive. And, and I, and it took me a while to learn that it took me getting chewed out from a couple of people saying, you didn't say hi to me. You didn't acknowledge me. And that's one thing I really appreciate about what they taught me when I was there. That is, it's important to acknowledge every single person in the room. When you walk some into some, and whether it's, you know, you, you know, you could use this in a, in a lot of ways, you, you know, do you acknowledge every single person at the table, every single person that helped you get to where you're at? And I learned that when I was down there. I, it's something that I've always tried to do and apply. When I walk into a room, I do my best to maybe not say hi to everybody, but at least give a wave or a nod and acknowledge that, hey, I recognize and I know that you're here. And, and, and I've noticed that in my life um, that people appreciate that. Um, and, and it's something very small that I learned when I was down there. That, that's a kind of a cultural thing. But these are people that have nothing to give. And the only thing they have to give is the way that they treat people. Um, you know, they, they don't have a lot, but what they do have, they, they, they keep it clean. They keep it, you know, let's say they have a shirt. They're going to, they're going to keep it nice. They're going to keep it pressed and ironed. If they have a pair of shoes, they're going to fix them and keep them because the very few things that they have, um, they, they value and the way that they value them is they take care of them. And I think it's the same thing with relationships that, that we have. And if we, if we value something, we're going to take care of it. And, you know, the, the crazy thing to me, it, I, was, my, I remember when my, my mom and my sister came down to Haiti, they remarked that, wow, you know, the, the country is so poor. But, you know, when we, when we show up to church on Sunday, you, you see these people in completely white shirts, totally pressed, um, totally well-kept people. And they were surprised. Like you would think, oh, wow, you know, they, they, they wouldn't take care of those things. Right. And so that's just something that I've, I've learned. Uh, I learned it at a young age that, you know, you, you're, it's, it's important to recognize that we, we need to, we don't, we, we spend a lot of money here in the United States. We, we don't value um, things at the same level other pe places in the world do. And, you know, I've tried to do my best to, to, to not live, um, in a way that that would go against everything that I learned down there. I learned so much from those people and, and I've been able to keep a lot of great relationships and I've been able to go back. It's so sad to see what's going on down there right now. Um, but I, but one thing that it is nice as a small business owner is I'm now in a position where I can direct aid or direct projects or be involved and step aside and, and be, uh, be able to give back, um, especially somewhere like Haiti that has, you know, so much to, so much need. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. You know, it, it's similar to the way that it was for me, except I, I served a mission as well in Belgium and France. So, you know, you spoke Haitian Creole, you can get by in French. I'm sure I could get by in Haiti because enough of them speak enough French that, you know, I could get around, but the, the greeting of people was a new thing for me. You know, I, I would walk into a church or some sort of, you know, apartment or office or whatever. And as soon as somebody walks in, they literally do, they go around and they greet every single person in that room. Mm -hmm. Right. And in Belgium and France, it's with, you know, a bisou, a kiss on the, on the cheek, you know, and, right. and that was just the, that's the greeting. That's the way that everybody greeted each other, but they did every single person. And if you skipped somebody by accident, <laughs> you were going to hear about it. They, they felt offended, you know? So mm -hmm. It's uh, that's really cool. So we should connect offline about the Haiti uh, thing as well, just because I'd love to go down and spend some time working down yeah. there. Like I said, I could get by with the French and, and do some, oh, yeah. some good down there. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You'd, you'd be just fine down there. In fact, they'd love to speak French. Um, I slaughter the French, so I stick to the Creole, but 
yeah, you, you would be just fine. If, obviously, as things need to settle down and, and they need to get through a new election, especially after their president was just assassinated. Um, but I imagine as things get a little bit more stable there, uh, yeah, let's do some stuff. Uh, and there's, there's connections that I have down there that would make it organized and efficient. And we are rallying, we're getting together some of the guys that I know and, and, and gals and companies uh, that want to be a part of that. So absolutely, that's something we should talk about. Yeah, very cool. All right, so let's jump back to the team that works with you now and or you know, other brokers that you've worked with uh, in the past. What, what are the traits that you see in those people that make them as successful as they are? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting to see some people you'd think and you meet these certain personalities and you're like, there's no way that that person would be successful at this and somehow they are. And there's really no one size fits all uh, in regards to personality types, um, but but it really is work ethic and ability to be self motivated, which uh, you know they're all independent contractors, and I have to trust my team, and they have they have to know that I trust them to the level that I trust them that they're going to want to provide for their families too, and so I give them a fairly decent leash. The best agents want that leash. I, I tend to struggle with the, the people that need more babysitting and, and I, I'm there to provide it. I've done it a lot throughout my career, um, but typically my experience has been the agents that want it are that and need it are usually the ones that don't last. Um, the most successful ones are, are very independent and they push against uh, they push against management and leadership and being managed and the idea of somebody managing them just makes them itch. And so, you know, they, they, because they, they can, they know they can do it themselves. And so what I learned as a, as a manager in, in the position of trying to support these, these top producing agents is that my job as an owner in the company and, and in the past as in senior management, my job was to remove roadblocks for those people. Right. I didn't need to manage them every single day, but I had to have enough foresight to say, okay, this is something that's going to get in the way of them producing. And it might mean they need another staff person. So how can we help them manage their staff better? Um, it might mean that they're, they're doing a client event and they've never done a client event before. So you get the people that are good at that and, and you help them, you know, manage this client event, you know, so that they're not doing it and, and focusing and let them be good at what they're good at. And taking away the things that that waste their time, and and I look at it as a dollar per hour um, formula. Like that, you have a three thousand dollar an hour producer if you can keep them producing all the time. Or and if they're spending their time doing you know the task of a twenty five or thirty dollar an hour task, um, and those are important tasks, and those are important positions, and people that fulfill those. Um, but let the people that are good at those tasks do those tasks and, and, and let those people that have the ability to go out and produce, um, let them produce and, and remove those roadblocks. And so that's typically the, the best people that I've worked with. That's how we've done it. Um, they're usually very difficult to manage. Um, and early on in my career, when I was, when I was um, new to management and I wanted this control like I'm the manager, I got to be in control. Um, when I managed that way, I was always frustrated. And, and, and I think my team was frustrated. They didn't like it. It was just, we were all, it was just this conflict that existed. And, you know, when you're with top producing salespeople in any organization, um, typically they're going to be the ones that point out the inefficiencies in your company. They're going to be the ones that come to you and say, hey, we're, you guys are really bad at this. And if you don't listen to them, then they're going to leave. They're going to go to another organization. Uh, um, and so I found that management actually got a lot easier when I decided to let them um, be them and do their business, how it works for them. And if I could be there to support them and guide them the best that I could um, and, and to be an ally versus, you know, somebody that's going to come in and, and, and make life difficult for them. And so that's how in my, in my career, I, I feel like I, I did pretty well at all the offices that I've overseen. We've had tremendous growth in, in every position that I've been in. 
at, from all the different offices and organizations that I've been a part of and in a management position. And, and a lot of it came from, and, and, that, and not even just along with the top producing salespeople, you know, what about the, admin, the administrative staff, letting them be good at what they're good at and letting them shine at the things they like to do. And if that means reorganize, reorganizing things so that one sta staff person does something that might be a little different than their job description, but they're good at it, let's let them do it. And, and you know, let somebody else on the team do something that they're good at and they want to do. I think we get, you know, so na narrow focused on what a job description is that we don't allow people to be creative and to, to harness what they like doing. And when, when you let people do what they enjoy, enjoy doing, they're going to work a lot harder and they're going to have more fun and they're going to give back and the clients are going to feel it. And as a result, that's how we've been able to, you know, in a lot of situations, 10 X revenues and, um, take non-productive offices and turn them into top producing offices and take very mediocre and average agents and turning them, turning them into top agents nationally. And, uh, and, and in their markets, uh, I've had the opportunity in a lot of the markets I've worked in to hire people out of college and turn them into the top producing investment sales agents in the cities that they live in across any company. And, and it really came off of just allowing them to be good at what they're good at. And not every agent is good at all the, every single thing that they need to be good at. And so you just got to find out what are they good at? What are they not good at? And how can I help them at least cover up their, their holes in their game? So that it's not as not as a big of an issue, and it's been a great, it's been very rewarding for me to work with people and to work with these independent contractors, which are really all small businesses, and helping them identify um, what it is that they're good at and what it is that they're passionate about, what it is that drives them, and help them achieve not just financial goals but life goals. And it's awesome to have somebody come back to you and they give you that hug or they they credit you with um, changing their life or accomplishing a goal that they never thought that they would have accomplished. And when you get those hugs and you get those thank yous, it makes it all worth it because as you know, management and senior leadership, it isn't always fun. You're, you're getting pushed from all sides and you're the one that's trying to keep it all together and, and keep things flowing smoothly. But it's been, those are the most rewarding moments uh, when people get to a certain level and not all of them do. Some people never take the time to turn back and, and thank those that pushed them along the way, but some of them do. And, and you never forget those moments when they do. Those are great, great moments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if I were to sum up, you know, what you just talked about specifically on their side, right? So, I mean, what you have to do as an owner or a manager is, is different than what they have to do to make themselves successful. They've got to not only be self-motivated, Mm -hmm. Right. Because you you shouldn't as a business owner, you shouldn't have to motivate somebody that you're not paying a salary to. Like if right. they don't go out and do something, they're not going to make any money. Right. right. So, yeah, they, they've got to be self-motivated, first of all. But then the second part of that that I heard is that they've also got to be self-aware. They've got to know what they're good at and what they're not good at. And they do need to be willing to accept some direction or help from you in hey, let us help you plan that client event. Let us help you provide a staff person that can do this or that for you because I see you and I know that what you're best at is either out there hunting for deals or closing deals or both, right? Yeah. And sometimes it's the same person. Sometimes it's two different people. Right, yeah, you're exactly right. And, and not a lot of them are willing to accept that. Uh, but the ones that are, those are the ones that are special. And those ones that are special uh, to, you know, it's really the sky is the limit in regards to how much, you know, they, how much they can do. Um, you know, I have, I have agents that did, and we're talking investment sales transactions that are in their thirties right now that are transacting between 50 and 60 commercial transactions a year. And, and it's one individual. We're not talking doing just three or four deals, but these ones, these very special, unique people that are willing to do what you just said, that are willing to say, Hey, where are the holes in my game? Can you help me fix them? Uh, those are the ones that really take it to the next level. And those aren't always easy conversations. Some of those conversations might be, you have really bad breath or you need to iron your shirt, <laughs> right? Or let's, yeah. you know, let's, uh, let's have a hard conversation. And those are, those are hard conversations to have. And, and you don't always couch it that way. You might, you, you gotta be careful on how you deliver some of that stuff. But typically when somebody's coming to you asking and being open and vulnerable 
And, and it, if you don't give them that feedback and you don't give them that help, they're just going to leave you. And so people, when, they, when they're in that position and they want to grow, they want that leadership, um, you know, gosh, it's fun. Uh, I mean, specifically, I, I, just at the top of my, uh, I have a lot of them, but there's one when I got to Denver, he was sitting in the bullpen still and, and in our offices, in order to earn a private office, you got to hit certain earnings. It's very cutthroat, like only the top producers sit in private offices. And, you know, I had hired him, I don't know, four or five years earlier. And I'd gone to a couple of different markets had left that office in Denver. And then I went back a second time to run that office and he's still sitting in the bullpen. And I pull him in and, and I, he had all kinds of ability and talent. And, and I asked him, I said, what are you doing still sitting in the bullpen? Like you're at this four or five years, you know, let's have a conversation. And it was somebody because I hired him and he had that trust in me. He'd given me that trust. I was able to help him out. And, you know, that person now is, you know, one of the top investment salespeople in all of Denver. He has a massive team. He's one of the best agents that I've ever worked with. And, and a lot of it was because we worked as a team. He could come into me and he would tell me things that were wrong with the company. And it helped me as a manager. And it was a back and forth. It, it was give and take. And, and man, what a rewarding partnership and how rewarding it is. Hopefully he listens to this. He'll, he'll know who it is. And I'm going to send it to him actually. Um, and, and how rewarding it is to see somebody that, you know, and in our industry, when you're the top producing commercial investment sales guy in any market, you're, you're a very, very successful business person. And, and you, um, you're a leader, you're a leader in the, in the, in the, in the city and you have relationships that manage it, that matter. And yeah, so that was one specifically of somebody that just exactly like you're just saying, who, uh, who listened and, and was open to that. And, and we were able to have, you know, challenging conversations. Yeah, no, that's really cool. So we're, we're running a little bit short on time, but there, I, I do want to get to a couple of real, real quick topics. One, because it comes up a lot with business owners that I work with, and that's how do you get into owning commercial real estate? We have the conversation with our business owners about the, the benefits of owning the building that you're operating your business in and how that can be beneficial in a myriad of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think a lot of people think that it's just way out of the realm. It's not possible. So, you know, let's talk about how you get into it. And then if we have a couple minutes left, I want you to just kind of hit real quick on the 1031 exchange and how yeah. concerning it is that this is potentially on the table with the new tax code. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I knew you were going to bring up the 1031 thing. That's great. I, uh, uh, that is definitely the hot topic right now. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for a minute. And then the first question, um, I'm, I'm, I'm missed the first part that you wanted me to go to. Just, just basics on how somebody on how to get gets in. into commercial real estate. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a small business owner, my opinion is that I think it's great. And you want to put your company, you got to do the analysis of whether you continue leasing or whether you buy, that's the first thing you got to look at. And, and the nice thing about buying is there are tax benefits to that and depreciation and depreciating the property. Um, there's going to be, you know, tax or interest, interest write-offs. Um, and so I think even though it might be a little more expensive to own the building, you, there's going to be more tax benefits to owning the building versus leasing the building. And so with your accountant, you run the analysis, is it worth leasing or is it le that's the first step you got to do. You got to figure out what your budget is. But the S SBA, the small business, you know, SB, there's great SBA loans. Um, and typically it's as little as 10% down. Um, and, and there, you know, pretty much every major bank has an SBA officer who does SBA loans for, for buying commercial properties. Typically it's very low down, but you have to occupy about half the building. And then you can rent out the other part, or you can just occupy the whole thing and own it yourself. I like the idea. Uh, if you're if you're first getting into it, get something you know where you can have another tenant in there, and you know they're helping you pay the mortgage. And I think that's a great option. And getting into that S that SBA loan, uh, it's not always easy to get into an SBA loan. The loans are typically harder to they take longer. You're gonna they're gonna dig into your company a lot more than than a, than a normal loan would. But, but I think that's the great way to go because most new companies and most companies that are first trying to get into real estate, 
they're, they need to hold on to their cash. And so hold on to your cash, you know, keep that reserve and, and get into an SBA loan and buy a property. If you have a bunch of cash or you could pay cash for a building, then do that. Or you can put 30 or 40% down, then just go get a normal conventional loan. And there, you know, you know, talk to talk to four or five of the local banks, get get in, get in touch with a, a mortgage broker. Like we have one in-house, a lot of commercial real estate firms do, where they have you know different loan programs available from different types of lending entities. And so making sure that you're working with professionals as well. Don't go it alone. It's the same thing. Like if you're a specialist in your business, it's like I don't do certain plumbing things at my house, even though I probably could, I could look it up at YouTube. I just don't do it. It's the same thing with real estate. Why don't go it alone? Go with an expert that know what they're knows what they're talking about. They're going to save you a lot of money, and you know a lot of people feel like when they sell their property, oh, I don't want to pay a real estate agent. You know, even when I sell my house, I I list it with a real estate agent and I'm licensed um, because I do commercial real estate. I have no idea what residential agents even do, um, and so you probably noticed that when we moved, I listed it with an agent, and so I, I think that's really important is make sure you're working with experts that you're working with good accountants, that you're working with a good financial planner and that you get these advisors talking and, and even with each other and a good attorney and making sure that you're doing the right thing for you and your company and setting it up correctly. Um, that's the first thing. That's to me, the easiest thing. If you're a small business owner, just get into a property that you can get into yourself. And then after that, after a few years that, you know, even down the road, that, that building's going to appreciate and maybe you you run out that space and you get a new loan on it and you're making a return on investment. You go get into another building. Typically what I see is people start that way and then they just continue to grow into other buildings. They pull out equity or they do a cash out refinance. You don't have to pay, you don't have to pay taxes on, on, you know, on a cash out refinance. So I think that's better than selling the building and paying taxes. And, and that leads us kind of into 1031 exchanges. Um, what is proposed on the table? It, I, 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 um, I hope it doesn't pass. Um, it could be devastating to our industry. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on it. Um, but, but what I can say that 1031 exchanges has allowed, um, commercial real estate owners to grow their wealth and defer the taxes on the sale of their buildings, uh, by purchasing other buildings. And what that does is that creates a tremendous amount of other types of income. Commissions are made by real estate agents. Um, you know, you have the title companies, you have the new management companies, you have new insurance deals that are run. And so it creates, um, it creates jobs and by, by having this 1031 exchange um, law in place, by taxing people and forcing them to pay taxes on sale, um, it's kind of like pulling the rug from, from under the system, a system that's been in place for a very long time. And that could cause a lot of, a lot of people a lot of financial distress. Um, it, affects, it affects, as you know, um, uh, estate planning. Um, it affects everything that I can imagine about what happens in our business. And what will end up happening my guess is if it does pass is fewer properties will sell. And when fewer properties sell and there's a lot of money chasing fewer deals, look what's happened in the residential market. It's gotten extremely expensive to buy properties. And I think what that does, it's just going to raise prices even more. It's going to make it more and more expensive for all of us to get into real estate uh, because there's going to be more money chasing fewer deals because people aren't going to want to sell because they're not going to want to pay those taxes. And so I don't think in the long run that it helps. I, I understand the concept and I understand why it, um, it's being proposed. And I think that additional tax revenue um, is absolutely needed and could be put to good use in a lot of places. But I, I think the long-term effects of it will actually be pretty devastating to the economy. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's no secret specifically after the pandemic that that our government and our economy, you know, needs tax revenue. We, we've got, we've taken on a whole lot of debt, but you hit the nail on the head that even though we need the tax revenue, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the right place to get it. Mm -hmm. 
right? They're not, they're not adding up all of the other stuff that you mentioned, all of the transactions that are, that are generated and the, the income taxes that are paid on those types of things and the corporate income taxes, the individual income taxes, all of that far outweighs the taxes that will be generated by this because what will happen is they just won't sell. The owners yep. won't sell the properties because they don't want to pay the taxes. Yeah. And so then you don't generate the tax revenue anyway. You, you right. just got to, from a business standpoint, in my opinion, there's a better way to generate tax revenue for the overall economy. Right. I totally agree. And you think about some of the states and cities that have, you know, th their own taxes on sale. Um, that's revenue that's going to be lost to those states as well. Even with the 1031 exchange, when properties are sold, there's, there's still sometimes a, a local tax that needs to be paid. You know, that's revenue that's going to dry up. And it, on a lot of different levels, I think they're really missing uh, the importance of having a high level of transaction velocity. And so I, I personally don't think that there's any way that this passes. I really don't. I don't know how. I think it's just way too disruptive to literally pulling the rug out from under. A lot of people have been doing 1031 exchanges for decades. And we have people with, with you know, the basis on their property from from sales that they did in the 1970s, um, and the ta the tax. And granted, I know it's capped, and it's you know there's certain amounts, but still, at the end of the day, um, those people are just going to stop selling, and they're not going to pay that tax. It would be it, it, there's just people that are totally averse to paying those types of taxes. Well, I tell you what, we could definitely talk about 1031 exchanges or real estate for probably another hour easily, um, but we are out of time. I, I appreciate the conversation. It's great to reconnect. It's great to see your face again after such a long time. Uh, I'm sorry you had to look at my face for the last hour, but it's great <laughs> to see yours. And, Thanks, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, so let's just, just finish real quick with, well, one thing I just want to make sure. We don't provide tax advice. We're not providing tax advice. And so if you have questions about a 1031 exchange, please reach out to your tax professional. But what this does highlight is the importance of doing tax planning on a proactive basis with your tax professional, because there's always things that are being proposed and that change in the tax code. You should always be tax planning specifically as a business owner. Um, but let, I'm going to give you the final word, Richard. Just tell us how to track you down. If anybody's interested in commercial real estate in the, in the southwestern United States, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Feel free. Anybody call. We're uh, happy to. If I if I can't work with you because of a licensing issue with the state, I'll put you in touch with somebody that I know. I I know good brokers in pretty much every state in the country. Uh, you can reach us on our website at www.tygcre.com. Or send me an email at rbird, B-I-R-D, at T-Y-G-C-R-E.com. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for being here, Richard. It's been awesome. Appreciate it. Awesome. Great to see you again. I look forward to talking soon. Yeah. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. platform.